Thank you. Martin, th these guys make me really nervous. Um, no, that's all right. Don't clever. be nervous. They're very, fr <laughs> they're very friendly. <laughs> um, I'm a sinner, and my works will never be enough to make me right or pleasing to God. And it doesn't matter how hard I try or what I do, it's, it's never really going to be enough. And that's obviously what, what I believe as a Christian. Um, but my question to you, Yusuf, um, and John, you could add to it if you wanted to, but my question, what I'd like to understand about the Islam faith is, how are your righteous actions or your good works um, ever going to be enough? Thank you. Good question. It, it, it's, it's one thing to say that someone's a sinner, and then you say, how, how is your good works going to be enough? You see, God Almighty is not like Shylock, that he needs his pound of flesh. The idea of God needing blood as a form of, of, of sacrifice to do away with your sins, it's something which is pagan in origin. It's not something which he teaches. If you look at the providence of God, God is almighty, God is all-knowing, God is all-wise, God can forgive. I would refer you to the story of the prodigal son, and I think as a learned Christian, you would probably be familiar with the story of the prodigal son. And the story of the prodigal son is, is something which finds quite a lot of resonance in terms of um, what I would believe in and what I would accept. It basically speaks here. It says, for this my son was dead. It speaks about a, the prodigal son. One son goes on the road to perdition, the other son is righteous. And he goes and says, um, where, the, where the good son tells the father, he says, But as soon as this thy son was come, which had devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said to him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. You see, in Christian theology itself, there is no difference. There is no difference between a sinless man and a repentant sinner. Are you telling me that a repentant sinner is of a lesser degree than a sinless man? That's not according to the theology that you'd find in Christianity. In fact, even in the parable of the lost sheep, it says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no particular repentance. So the idea of a repentant sinner is no difference from a sinless person. The idea of Jesus dying for the sins of man again raises a number of problems because if on the one hand we were to say that God had to come down to die for the sins of humanity to which I then ask do you then mean that God died and a Christian would say no 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 only the man died but if the man died then where is the ultimate sacrifice where is the ultimate sacrifice if only the man died and God did not die? If God died, then who would look after the affairs of the world? So you believe that God somehow lived and the man died. Now if Jesus died as a man, knowing full well, I mean if Jesus died as God and he knew full well that his death would be as a result for the salvation, then there was no sacrifice on his part because he knew that God would be raising him. But if on the other hand, he died as a man, knowing full well that God would eventually save him and raise him, then where is the ultimate sacrifice? So you see, that's a problem that you find in Christian theology, which hasn't been resolved for centuries. And I don't expect John to resolve it, and I don't think he can resolve I that idea I will. particularly now. Just give me a moment, uh, I will. Thanks. But, but I, want, I, I, want, I want to deal with this, that the idea, nowhere in the New Testament or the Gospels does Jesus say, in the Gospels, does Jesus say, I have come to die for your sins? Why is it when the person came to him and asked him, Good master, what good thing shall I do to enter eternal life? Why call us on me? Good. If you will enter eternal life, I will die for your sins. Why didn't Jesus say that? He said, No. If you will enter eternal life, keep the commandments. James says, faith without action is dead. It's only later on, when you look at the evolution of the Gospels and the evolution of Christian tradition, that you find the idea of somebody having to die for the sins of humanity. But again, Scripture, okay, just if it teaches... No thanks. Okay, just, I'll just run out on this. In Genesis 3.16, you read the expression, Unto the woman he said, I'll greatly multiply your sorrow and conception. In sorrow shall you conceive, and your desire shall be to the husband. He shall rule over you. 
that ruling and that desire to the husband was as a result of the original sin. Childbirth was as a result of the original sin. Patriarchy was as a result of the original sin. Now, if Jesus came to redeem mankind and died for the sins of mankind, up to this point in time, we still have childbirth. Women still go under pangs of pregnancy, which the Quran says is a source of their reverence, not as a source of the inferiority. And still, the idea in terms of which... Um, Righteous action and faith in God can only leave you to eternal okay, salvation. Yusuf, are you are you done? Thank you. Yeah. So there's no evidence in the Gospels or by Jesus where he said, "I have come to die for the sins of mankind." If there yeah. is, Thank you. then John will have to point it out to me. Thank you, yes, John. Yes, I, I I really I really have to say that I'm I'm meeting Yusuf for the first time, and I'm slightly disappointed because Yusuf is rehashing dead arguments that have been just said over the centuries and i thought as a scholar you would have moved on a little further but unfortunately i'm hearing the same old arguments just being repeated and repeated which means you're just refusing to listen to christians and what they are saying and i'm saying that if we really want to engage with each other yusuf we've got to listen to each other john now, can you can you listen to you john let, let me say that let me john, say this. could you answer the question yes please. the question is this jesus you said that islam doesn't believe in sacrifice islam believes in sacrifice and you know that Islam believes in sacrifice. Islam may not believe in sacrifice for salvation. Islam believes in blood sacrifice. And you know that. But that is a different matter. Now, about Jesus' sacrifice, Jesus' death. Let me put it this way, Yusuf. That, you see, you are talking about a man dying for another man. That is a complete misunderstanding of Christian theology. I have just said to you, for us, Jesus as God is our father. It is about a father taking the place of his sons and, and daughters. It is not about a man dying for another man. Did it's, God die? I, I'm coming to that. Okay. I'm coming to that point. You know, when, and when you ask me those primary school questions, if God died in the three days, what, who, who was in charge of the earth? This, this for me are primary school questions. Because you see... But your kindergarten let, belief. I'm, I'm going yeah. to answer you. I'm going to answer if you let me. You, you tell me, and Muslims tell me every day, Allahu Akbar. God is great. If God is great as you believe God is great, I believe there is nothing that God cannot do. All right, including we're dying. Stop there. Thank you. Including what we're going to do? What we're going to do so right God now? God died. What we're going to do right now is uh, Yusuf. You have got three minutes, and I'm going to stop you at three minutes to end off. Why Muslim? Three minutes, and then John is going to end off three minutes. Why Christian? And uh, then we're going to thank them, and then we're going to leave. So, Yusuf, we're in your hands. Um, just exactly three minutes. Yes, exactly three minutes, Yusuf. <laughs> okay. I think just let me, I want to end on a positive note. And I think it's good that we as Muslims and Christians can come together in a church. I want to point all of you out to the first of all commandments. In the Old Testament, you read the expression, Shema Israelu Adonai Ilahainu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. A thousand years after Moses, a scribe comes to Jesus and questions him, Master, what is the first of all commandments? And Jesus repeats word for word what Moses said a thousand years before, which is Shema Israelu Adonai Ilahainu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Some 600 years later, a Christian deputation from Najran in Southern Arabia, they come to the Prophet Muhammad, they spend three days in the mosque, they sleep in the mosque, they eat in the mosque, and on Sunday, they engage in their religious services in the mosque. And there comes a point in time where they question the Prophet. They tell him, now Muhammad, tell us what is your concept of God? And Muhammad is made to say, Qul, huwallahu ahad. Say, O Muhammad, he is God the one and only. Now, interestingly enough, Moses, in referring to God as one and only, used the word ikhad. Jesus, in referring to God as one and only, used the word ikhad. Muhammad used the word ahad. What is the difference between ikhad and ahad? Since Hebrew and Arabic are sister languages, essentially it is the same system, the same value system. Therefore, when John was speaking about me picking and choosing a religion, I wasn't picking and choosing a religion. I was simply pointing out the trajectory in terms of which an individual needs to go back to the original religion. And that original religion or that original faith was the faith in total submission to the will of God. When Jesus says, Oh my father, take this burden away from me, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He was submitting himself as a Muslim to the will of God. 
In conclusion, I would like to state that we can still be Christians and we can still be Muslims. But I would submit that there are three essential criterion for being a Christian today, which this church can accept as well. One, belief in the existence of one God. Two, acceptance of the ethical and religious authority and leadership of the historical personage of Jesus Christ. And three, a commitment to viewing the life of Jesus as a disclosure and a human exemplification of the moral excellence of deity, such that the imitation of Jesus's behavior is already a moral action in the particular believer's life. If we are to accept this as the essence of Christianity, as many modern day Christians can do today, as the Anglican bishops who say that it's no longer necessary for you to believe in Jesus as God to be a Christian, you can still be a Christian without accepting him as being divine. If that is the only sole difference, then what is there to prevent 1,200 million Muslims and 1.5 billion Christians from coming together on a common platform in the worship of the one and the only eternal God? And Thank so you. basically, if there are other routes to salvation, then in conclusion, there is no need indiscriminately to impose or force a particular cultural belief on inferior uh, on inferior pr uh, people and if christianity can do this can at last put down in inverted commas the so-called western man's burden then it will truly liberate itself and we will see humanity heading towards the eternal good for till the end of times thank you and god thank bless you, you. Yusuf, and, and thank well you done. for all the time and thank you for the privilege for speaking in this church thank you, thank you. Thank you, John. Three minutes on why, why Christian. Yeah. I, I, I want to say that, uh, as I said, for me, one of the things that I find very positive of, for being a Christian is that I have a lot to talk just about from my Christian faith and from my Christian sources. And I have a witness to bear. And I think that one of the things that Christians and Muslims have to learn to do, and I have, I, this has been my principle all along, and what I'm doing even tonight is out of character. I believe that we, if we really have a witness to bear, to share, we should share that witness. We should simply say why a Muslim, without saying why not that, because that's what we need to hear. Now, one of the things I have learned this evening is that from Yusuf, is that Muslim is generic term. Islam is generic term. Now what this raises in my mind is that, in other words, everyone is a Muslim and no one is a Muslim. If, if it is all generic and therefore it doesn't matter, then everyone is a Muslim and at the end of the day, no one is a Muslim. The other thing is that, one of the things again I want to plead is that when we are engaging with Christian Muslim discussions, we should deal with mainstream it is very easy to to quote i know yusuf loves that because i've i've watched him on youtube yusuf loves quoting liberal christian scholars now i have got a litany of liberal muslim scholars some of them are south african muslim scholars now they are in the fringes of the faith community if you are quoting those liberal scholars then you are not really engaging with the mainstream christian body that you have to engage with so i would rather not quote liberal muslim scholars except for a particular point that I want to make. But do not, I will not use it against Islam because I know they are on the fringes. And to quote liberal Christian scholars is just uh, being on the fringes. Finally, do Christians believe in one God? I want to say that Christians believe in God is that God is one. Islam says God is one. Christians believe that God is only. Islam says that God is the only one. Christians believe that God is alone. You can't compare anything to God. Islam believes that God is alone. We can't compare anything to God. Now, where we, we part company is that we Christians don't believe that God is lonely. God is not lonely. Islamic God is lonely. And I'm saying that for the Christians believe in God, we believe that God is in communion. God is in fellowship. God is in fellowship with us. And what does it mean? It calls us to communion, to fellowship, and to have time to, 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 be, to, to, to respect one another and to commune with each other rather than just dealing with each other as individuals. So communion, fellowship, 
It's a very integral part of Christian belief, drawing from our belief in the triune God. God three in one, because God is not lonely. And Jesus, we believe, is the son of God, because as I said, I have to make a choice. And that's why I'm a Christian. I had to make a choice, as I said, Sorry, to either go with the witness about Jesus in the New Testament, which was written close to Jesus' time, or to go about the witness of Jesus in the Quran that came 700 years later. And I believe that those that were written by the Gospels are much more sound. Thank, Thank you. you, John. I'm going to end off this evening just by thanking a couple of people. First of all, to thank David Sikkim for arranging this evening and for inviting John and Yusuf to be with us. So, David, thank you so much for your help and your invitation and for being with us here this evening. Then I do want to thank Yusuf and John for the uh, for the for the for the spirit in which we've had this discussion and debate this evening I think it's been a friendly and a warm but an honest spirit that we've been able to speak honestly and to share what we believe as Muslims and as Christians so can I ask you to put your hands together to thank John and Yusuf <laughs> Do remember the uh, DVD address that was placed on the screen earlier on if you want to order copies from from this evening you can you can do so thank you so much for coming and for staying thank you for your questions and your contribution and God bless you <laughs>